okay? So there you have it. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you so much for the gift of life. Thank you for the supply of your spirit. Thank you for the things that you have proposed to do. Today, we thank you because we have already begun experiencing you. Thank you for refreshing our hearts. Thank you for renewing our minds. Thank you for causing your light to shine as your word comes forth. Thank you because it comes in simplicity, with accuracy, and with power. Your word is rightly dividing and discerning the intent and our thoughts and causing us to be realigned with your purpose. Thank you for filling us with your whole counsel today. We receive instruction, direction, encouragement, clarity, Lord. We thank you. We give you all praise in Jesus' mighty name. Amen, amen, and amen. All right. Um, I feel like I haven't done what I normally do, so please do it. Just say hi to the person seated beside you, because I don't, I don't recall you guys did it. Yeah? Say good morning to the person seated beside you, and welcome them to service. Okay. Um, in the same vein, let's appreciate everyone who's joining us online, and thank them for joining us today. Um, so majority of them, we believe, are outside of Nigeria. That's the only reason why they are staying online. If you have friends who are still worshiping online and they're in this Lagos, can I ask that you please encourage them to show up in church from time to time? There is the blessing of fellowship and just being here. A lot of people are still isolating in our generation, not because of COVID, but because they're just dealing with stuff. Sometimes it's guilt and shame. Just, I don't feel like I'm good enough for God's presence. And that is a lie from the pit of hell. So would you do well to, you know, let the Holy Spirit speak through you as you encourage them to try and begin to show up and fellowship with other believers. It will do them a world of good. All right, and I also want to say today, Sola, thank you so much for sharing. God bless you. I know that took a lot. Um, but thank you for, you know, um, sharing your life's journey with us. And I know that it ministered grace to everyone who heard and I ask, I write on the prayers that have been offered already, but I ask that the Lord will reveal himself to you more and more, and that you would grow in, in your knowledge and understanding of who he is to you personally in Jesus' name. And I love you. You know that. I love you. Okay, so the laws of progress is the teaching that we started a couple weeks back. And in my usual manner, I'm going to ask, who can tell me? what we have covered so far in the last uh, three to four weeks, yeah? Anyone? Maybe I have a gift again today. No, take, you have to take it from the top. You have to, that's, how, that's how you know a good scholar. So what was the very first message on that, this teaching series? God Factor, thank you. Followed by? Law of Vision, next. Excellence. Law of Excellence. And last week, innovation. Law of Innovation. And under the Law of Innovation, thank you very much. Please put your hands together for yourselves. <laughs> Appreciate you, yourselves. Under the Law of Innovation, we touched on the law of recognition. I spoke quite extensively about the power of recognition and the importance um, of being able to see, of being able to gain divine perspective or, and um, you know, just en enjoying insight and foresight, being able to recognize opportunities uh, that God presents our way for advancement and for progress. Today we go on very quickly into another law called the law of excellence, the law of excellence. And I know that if you haven't been a part of this teaching, there is a way you can, in your mind, attribute this to what you already learned maybe at business school you know, at, uh, at some management program or some leadership certification that you have done. Um, but I want to say to you that it's not quite it. While some of the principles that will be touched might be similar, but I need you to listen with the ears and the eyes, uh, you know, of the Spirit. Let the Spirit of God open up your mind um, to what God wants to say to you specifically, because God has quite a bit to say to us this morning as we prepare for 2024. And as we start to recalibrate, you know, as we start to re-envision the things that um, God would have us do. One of the questions that I have had to ask 
in the last quarter of this year is who do I need to become for my 2024 journey? And I want to ask that, you know, you can equally borrow from that question. Who do I need to become? I find that there is always someone that God needs for us to become. There is always a higher calling. There is always a higher dimension to our existence. And our ability to effectively engage the mind of God for what do I need to know? Who do I need to be? Where do I need to be? What should I be doing? Every time. And we don't treat the advent of years as just everything, you know, as just the norm. Yeah, it's another year, so what big deal? We cannot afford to be those who trivialize the advent of, you know, months and new seasons. For a new year, we recognize it's a new season. It is an opportunity for God to do stuff with us, to do stuff through us, and also to do stuff for us. So who do we need to become for all of the grand plans and the vision that is upon the Father's heart for us, for our world, for our community, for our family? And I recognize that some of us have already begun having those conversations, and God is already speaking to you that this season that you are in, you know, as you prepare for 2024, it's an unusual one, and you need to posture differently. You can't afford to be lax about it the way you have been previously. I had an opportunity to, you know, speak to a group of people, a group, a group of young people in the UK over the weekend, and, and uh, Friday night, actually. And one of the things I was saying to them is, look, when, when, we, when, we talk, when, when we think about being positioned, there's so many scriptures that, you know, come to mind. Let me take the posture of the blessed man in Psalm 1 and things that the blessed, the state of blessedness or the state, the posture that God attributes to a blessed man, the, the things that he can do and the things that he cannot do, the things that is permitted and the things that are not permitted. Now, the truth is some of these things, you can decide you want to walk with the slothful, you can decide you want to sit in the, you know, at the seat of the scornful, you can decide because with life, you are always making decisions. You and I are always making decisions. And sometimes we can be trivial and casual with our decisions. But by the time you read Psalm 1, it says to you, blessed is the man that does not. So it means that to be able to attract a, or to, to own a certain level of blessedness or to own that nature, that state, there are certain things that you and I are not permitted to do or to be because it contradicts God's expectation of us. So help me ask, I'll be as the person seated beside you, who are you becoming next year? Who do you need to become next year? Someone needs to become a man of, of prayer. Someone needs to become a woman of the word. Someone needs to become, you know, a, a, a man of grace who enjoys different dimensions of grace. And the, the, the reality is we assume that these things naturally come to us because we are God's children. But today, as we go through the law of execution, I'm sorry, did I say the law of excellence? I apologize. <laughs> it's execution. The law of execution is what we're discussing this morning. As we go through this, I need you to remember the salient points from everything we've touched on, the God factor, because I will be referencing some of the things that you may have heard in those teachings. The God factor, vision, um, excellence, and of course, innovation. Because we're putting it all together and we're at, got, gradually winding down on these laws that make for progress and advancement, okay? So let's read together from scripture. And we'll read James chapter 1, verses 22 to 25, the message translation. James 1, 22 to 25. So multimedia already helps you. Aha, yeah, it's already in my slides. Let's read together. One, two, go. Don't fool yourself into thinking that you're a listener. Can we say it with a bit more bass in our voices? Yeah? Don't fool yourself into thinking that you're a listener when you are anything but letting the word go in one ear and out the other. Act on what you hear. Those who hear and don't act are like those who glance in the mirror, walk away, and two minutes later have no idea who they are and what they look like. But whoever catches a glimpse of the revealed counsel of God, the free life, even out of the corner of his eye, 
and sticks with it. He's no distracted scatterbrain, but a man or woman of action. That person will find delight and affirmation in the action. I apologize, I recognize that some of us may not have been able to see the screen clearly, um, but hopefully you got down the scripture and you can check your phone uh, or your device for it. But please help me ask someone, and of course with a lot of love, so they don't think you're disrespecting them. Are you a scatterbrain or a man of action? <laughs> Are you a scatterbrain or a woman of action? No, guys, you know in life points here, yeah, we're very real. We say it as it is. It's not be me talking. It's Bible. It's not Bible just right now. It says, if you're not behaving, if, if you don't get your act right, you are distracted. In fact, it says, is no distracted scatterbrain. So let me ask them, are you a distracted scatterbrain? <laughs> Somebody say, oh my God. <laughs> or you are a man of woman, or woman of action. Are you okay? So let's 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 focus on the positive. Let me ask them or say to them, I hope that you are a man of action or a woman of action. Yeah, that's better, right? <laughs> that fills us with a bit more a, 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 a whole lot more joy. Because I feel like that scatterbrain is giving some people shackles already. It's worrying you like my goodness. I know you're calling me out. Why are you why are you doing this to me? Yeah. But we are men and women of action, and th that is what God wants of us, yeah? His expectation is that we will find delight and affirmation as we go through that which it is that he has described. But to go through, see, we've spoken quite a lot about the need to hear and to capture God's thoughts, right? To engage his mind. We've spoken quite extensively in the course of this teaching series about the need to stay in the place of prayer, to be still, you know, and to be quiet before him, to receive his, his thoughts for us, to receive these grand plans and vision that he has for our lives. We've spoken about the need to reflect, you know, what needs to change? What should I stop doing? What should I start to do? What, and all of these things, as we stay in that place where we tarry in God's presence, we, we lean on the Holy Spirit to help us to, you know, make this, um, uh, this analysis, as it were, and, and to, do, to conduct these reviews objectively. We also look to, you know, friends, what do, if you have good friends, you know, people who can give you feedback and say, oh, so I thought that, you know, you can improve here. These are the skills you have. It is, it, you, there's so many things. But we're saying, by the time you put it all together, it must culminate in action. It must all come together, inspiring you to take action. It's not enough to do all of that groundwork. It's not enough to receive the mind of God to get his thoughts and you do nothing about it. Which is why we feel the need to zone in on execution. In fact, research has shown that in Christian, okay, maybe, not, maybe in religion in general, but let me zone in on the one that I know, which is Christianity. There is a lot of lights in the church, right? You and I are light. But it's not corresponding to, or we're not seeing corresponding action. That light is not necessarily giving life to men, which is why we have a lot of challenges as believers, right? Perhaps we're not leveraging wisdom enough. For some of us, it's that we are in that place of fear, and fear has immobilized us from taking action. But today, as we go through this teaching, I pray for you that the Holy Spirit will set you up, just like Ezekiel declared in Ezekiel 2.2. It says, the Spirit of the Lord spoke to me, and I heard what the Spirit said, and he set me up on my feet. I decree over you in the name of Jesus that the Spirit of God will set you up on your feet to take in action in Jesus' name. When you go to Isaiah 46 from verses 10 and 11, I'll read that very quickly. Isaiah 46, 10 and 11, it says, Declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, here is God speaking, and I will do all my pleasure. I will do, note that word, action word, calling a bed of prey from the east, the man who executes my counsel from a far country. Indeed, I have spoken it, I will also bring it to pass. I have purposed it, I will also do it. God is a doer. Not only is he a, an innovator or a creative, he's equally a doer. In fact, the introduction of to us in Genesis 1, 
speaks to is not only his creative ability, the fact that he envisioned these things and he brought them to be, is the fact that he did. I don't know if you have people around you who are, they're, they're, they're ideas banks, they're ideas people, always overflowing with ideas. And sometimes you feel like, if I had the capacity to even think the way you think, I would have hammered long time. I would have blown significantly. My bank account would be flowing with money. Because these people, they know how to think. They know how to bring to birth beautiful ideas. Sometimes you hear, it's like, ah, did this come out of you? But their capacity for execution is zero. They don't take action. When you ask them and you follow up, so that stuff you told me about, that business idea you shared with me, how far? They would always have one legit excuse or another why they have not taken action. From funding or capital to I don't have something, I need something, something hasn't happened, I am waiting for some, you know, there is always a reason. Scripture says that the one that considers the clouds will not sow. And so as you go through, one of the things that the Holy Spirit will do for you today under this teaching, and even afterwards, is to spotlight the areas of your life where you need to get up and start moving, where you have stayed and sat in far too long. And the Father is calling you out to say, look, this idea has not outlived its welcome, but it has stayed for quite a bit. It's time to get up and get moving. And I have a number of stories that I can share with you about my own personal experiences, but let me, let me, let me reference one. So I remember maybe sometime in 20, I think it was in 2014, prior to then, sometime between 2012 and 2014, you know, I had been wanting to do something for kids on personal finance. I had spent quite some time, I think it started sometime in 20, yeah, 20, sometime about 20, either 2010 or 2012, I apologize. I'd been meditating on it for quite a bit. I started doing the groundwork, like making my notes, building a curriculum, how I was going to run these personal finance um, classes, summer classes for kids. I had researched quite extensively. Um, I had begun to explore certain collaborations. Some, I, I took a trip then, I think in, 2020, in 2010 then, I went, I went to Dubai. And so I went to Kidzania, and I said, oh my goodness, I can do a lot. How do, how do I get these people to, if I had written to them, they told me I needed like a billion naira, you know, the equivalent of a billion naira for me to establish <laughs> the equivalent of Kidzania in Nigeria, you know. Of course, I put that idea aside, so I was like, okay, I have to get funding, etc. But my point was, as I continue, now if you, if you know me, if you, <laughs> if you know me, you know that I like things done a certain way. I've had to learn how to move without waiting for everything to be perfect. But from building the curriculum and choosing my faculty and deciding, guys, I had rented a place in VGC, by the way. I would rented a house in VGC where I was going to hold these summer classes. And so I used to go there. That was where I would sit and ideate from, and I had all sorts on my board and all that. And my husband asked, how far? When are we launching this thing? He said, I'm coming, I'm coming. It's not, it has not cooked well, you know, and I just kept going at it and going at it and getting curriculum, doing all sorts, you know, spoken to a few of my friends, you, you're gonna train this for, uh, on this particular course for me. It was for, not children, for teenagers, because I was in teens ministry, and just, I had like all these grand plans. And then, one day, I woke up, and I stumbled on something on social media. Somebody had started exactly what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And I was so discouraged. Because the person did not even, in terms of like what, the level I had carried my thinking to, the person had not even gotten there, but the person had started. And God said, you see? you see? Ideas are like, permit me to use the word, they're like pixie dust, you know? And so when you sit there, and you are still roberooing in the idea, God will go and look for, because there's a need to be met, and we need to understand sometimes the urgency in the spirit for these things. You go and find somebody who's ready to get up and go in faith and not waiting for perfect conditions before they take action. So I'll share that story with you just, again, to frame the conversation on the power of execution, getting up and moving. Now, it doesn't mean that I could not still have continued. I have a ton of ideas that I could, I mean, that I came up with and I, I left and, you know. It didn't mean that I could not have continued, but I guess I just also lost the, 
the zeal to continue after having spent a number of years just building the idea. I have another one that I'm working on now, and, and someone should just ask me how far that idea. Uh, just ask me how far. Maybe you should, you should hold me accountable. Anyway, um, so we see here that God is a doer, and he's looking to partner with doers, people who will get up and get moving, like a Noah, who will receive an instruction, haven't never seen it before, or figured out what it would look like, but trusting in the word of the one that, they has, that has called them to execute, that they will get up and get moving, right? So, it is the doers, not hearers, that are blessed, because they execute what they have heard. Amen. It is doers, blessed. In fact, scripture says in Deuteronomy, it says that God will bless the works of our hands. It's the works of your hands, not your thoughts, not your meditation that God blesses. The Holy Spirit inspires, you know, the thoughts. He inspires the meditation. But it is the works that get blessed because it is the works that demonstrate, you know, the, and reveal the glory of God. It is the works that show to man what is possible with God and in God, which is why God is very big on our output, which is why I said last week that God will command man, say, be fruitful, multiply, increase, replenish the earth, subdue it. If he didn't put that DNA in man, he will not call it or have an expectation of it. When you go, to, go through scripture, the story of the parable of the talent you see what Jesus did with, um, you know, the story he told about the people who were given talent by the master. Some were given five, two, and one. Let's see what the guy with the one talent says. So you go quickly to scripture. Open your Bibles to Luke chapter, please give me a minute, sorry. Matthew 25. Matthew 25. When you read from verses 24, it says, But he who had received one went and dug in the ground and hid his Lord's money. Then he who had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I know you to be a hard man, or I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. And I was afraid and went and hid your talent in the ground. Look, here you have, or there you have what is yours. But his Lord answered and said to him, I want us to read that part together. What did he call him? You wicked and lazy servant. You wicked and lazy servant. And you know when you look at that, isn't that such a very harsh judgment for somebody that did not lose the money, right? Would it not have been better suited to the one that you gave talent to and you came back and he's telling you stories of how you cannot even find the talent again? When you call that one wicked and lazy, then we understand it, right? But it appears as though the master was saying here that he might have even paid me if you told me that you put this money to work and then you experienced some challenges in the way and you lost it. Then you're not doing anything with it and hiding it. Are we together? Now, if you go to the previous verses, right, you would understand the concept of this description a bit more because the master Scripture says that he was gone for some time. After the passage of time, he came back and he asked for an account. So there was the passage of time. So it wasn't that I gave you one talent last week and I'm coming back this week to ask you, but there was time. So the guy could have buried the talent, you know, maybe week one or month one. But the expectation is that at some point you should have come to your senses to say, ah, this talent they gave me self, even if this man is a wicked man, let me even try and do something with it. Let me even try and figure out what to, what to do with it. The guy didn't take action. Or I like to say he took the wrong type of action because he, took a, he expended effort and energy in bearing that one talent. So my question to you this morning is this. What has God given you? What has he placed in your hands that you are doing nothing about? Perhaps you think it is too small, it's insignificant, or maybe you have taken the posture of this servant and you feel like, well, God will be all right. He has many children. We are many. So even if I don't do anything with it, somebody will do something about it. Or you are not even aware that you have been gifted as such. 
What ideas has God given to you in recent times? What is the, you know, sometimes we focus on just ideas coming. Sometimes your experiences also demonstrate to you or spotlight to you things you need to you pay attention to, things that you and I need to pay attention to. Some of us have a pain area. Now, if you're melancholic, you probably have a number of pain areas like me. And then your ability to be able to recognize which one God is calling you to do something about. Sometimes it's in your organization. Sometimes it's in your family. It's in your community. What keeps you up at night? What is that thing that constantly tugs at your heartstrings and, you know, makes you uncomfortable? That there's surely you have not become so desensitized to what is going on that you are not recognizing that there's something here. And we've said, pray through it so it doesn't feel as though you're just jumping in. But I find that the children of the world, they seem to get this concept. You see people make a whole thing out of a problem, out of a pain, out of a challenge. They're providing water in a community. They're doing stuff there, you know. They go ahead and they find creative solutions to solving existing problems. And while that speaks to the innovative DNA, as we said last week, the challenge you and I is, are we taking action? Are we taking action? All right, so how do we take action? How do we execute better? But before I go into that, let me read very quickly from Numbers 13, verses 31 and 32. This is concerning the spies that were sent to you know, check out the land. It says, but the men who had gone up with him said, we are not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. And they gave the children of Israel a bad report of the land which they had spied out, saying, the land through which we have gone is a land that devours its inhabitants, and all the people whom we saw in it are men of great stature. Right? Now, I will come back to that scripture in just a bit, because... One of the things that God needs to help us deal with very clearly as we prepare for next year is the state of our minds. Sometimes we are incapacitated by fear, immobilized by negative experiences, you know, um, and just different things. Li li uh, limiting, yes, limiting mindsets. Where we think that we're not sufficient enough, we're not capable, you know, and I know that there's a thin line between being self-aware and, you know, limiting mindsets. Actually, it's not a thin line. It's a very major difference. But I find that a lot of people confuse it because in the process of saying, I am self-aware, I understand the things that I don't have, the things that I am lacking in, the question is, what are you doing about them? But the limiting mindset is, I am not this person that you're describing to me, BWS. I don't, I, I, I'm struggling to see myself in that light. And I'd rather be safe. Is that I, I don't see this person, this, this person that you said God has designed to, to be creative, to be innovative. I'm not seeing that person through my own lenses from where I am. Because this person exists in Nigeria. Things don't work there. The ease of doing business index is at X whatever. Nigeria is on number 100 or whatever on the list of the ease of doing business index. So how, how are you saying to me to go and build this business? How are you saying to me to go and write this book? How are you saying to me to go and sing this song? How are you saying to me to produce this type of result? When the conditions that will facilitate that progress are not there. So would you let the Holy Spirit break down these myths in your heart and just, you know, dispel them completely? So how do we execute? How do we execute better? The first thing is planning. And it sounds like a no-brainer because you cannot execute where, what, you don't, what you have not planned, right? You should have a plan that you're then executing. So it sounds like a no-brainer. But the element of execution uh, of planning here that I want to touch on is not just to ideate. Like I said, a lot of us have plans, but then we don't take action. So it is planning that makes execution better. That is the planning we're focusing on. The one, planning that helps you execute. The quality of your thoughts 
being rightly positioned to also receive those thoughts. Scripture says in 1 Corinthians 9, 24, it says, do you not know that those who run in the race all run, but one receives the price? So run in such a way that you may obtain it. And while it is that Paul here is speaking very clearly to our spiritual experience and our spiritual work with God, we're going to borrow it to talk through how to execute better, right? He says, run in such a way that you may obtain it. So there is a way to run, clearly, using the analogy of athletes. And when you think about it, the guys who have successfully, I mean, I don't know if there's any athletes in our midst, you've won a couple races in your life, you run, you've run marathons and sprints or whatever. But when you look at your Usain Bolt and you, you know, listen to their documentaries and things like that, the number of hours they train, anybody who's an athlete here, I don't expect that one of the things that you would do to get in shape or to keep in form would be perhaps skating, ice skating. And you say, I invest six hours of my day in ice skating because I am preparing to you know, become the world athletics champion. There's a mismatch. So Paul is saying here that there is a way to run. And some of us, unfortunately, are bogged down with running or em em embracing principles that are not allowing us to run effectively. There is a way to run so that we may obtain it. And everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. I'm still reading 1 Corinthians 9. He says, now they do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we do it for an imperishable crown. Therefore, I run thus, not with uncertainty. That is also another way to run. That's another way to take action. I recognize that the things that I have put my hands to are the things that would make for success. The things that I sense that God is calling me to, the things that I recognize are important to him, things that are, have eternal relevance, things that are beneficial to my community, things that would improve the life and the, the well-being of those around me. Those are the things that I am committing to. So I recognize that there is a price to be won. I recognize that there is joy ahead you know, of this um, race that I'm running and the discipline that I need to bring to bear so that I can run and run it well. He says, first, I fight not as one who beats the air. Now, if you, I don't know if anyone here is familiar with boxing. I know there's something called shadow boxing, right? But all of the experience I have with boxing, aside from watching just a bit, not a lot, um, is in the gym. When my trainer decides that we are working out our arms today, and so he says, I should box. When he says, when he asks me to start boxing, just punching the air, I don't give it my best. Because for me, I don't, mentally, I'm struggling. To, I, I know I see boxers, you know, do it with a lot of gusto when they're punching the air, like they have seen a human being or a spirit that they're beating out or beating up. But for me, it's not quite like that. However, there is more impact when he places the boxing bag in front of me or he wears the pads. And I ha there's, a, there's an aim, right? There's a target before me. I'm able to apply my punches well. I'm able to exercise those arms well. Now, it's kind of like the same for you and I in other areas of our lives. Some of us are punching the air. We are going round and round in circles. We're doing so many things that are not coming together. There is no target, there is no focus, which is why we're saying there is a need to plan and to plan effectively. There is a need to plan with the mindset of execution that as I'm documenting and highlighting the things that I need to do, so the questions you're asking yourself in the planning process is what is the end goal? What do I want to achieve? I want to be certified in a particular course, for example. So what do I need to do? What exams do I need to write to add this skill to myself? How many hours of study is, it, is required you know, to be able to do that? When will I study? What days of the week am I going to set aside for this study? Do I need a study group or can I self-study? We need to be able to ask ourselves these very intelligent questions, and this is just in one area. You want to get married. You, are, you cannot be throwing punches in the air. It's not about, some of us are making plans, and all we're thinking about is where you're going to have the wedding, your wedding dress, who's going to design it, who's going to cater, which event manager are you going to, I mean, event planner you're going to use. Will my wedding be featured on Bella Niger or not? My goodness, that cannot be, that cannot be a plan. That is so, as in, 
is so far removed. What type of wife will I be? What kind of husband will I be? What do I know about parenting? What do I know about you know, intimacy in marriage, communication? How do I oil the wheels of our marriage to make, make sure that it is sustained and it, we are in it for the long haul? What is the vision that you have concerning your marital destiny? When you think about your children, what, what comes to mind? Some of us are right now are still very clueless about parenting and we're looking to getting married. What books am I reading? What books am I reading about parenting, about marriage? So planning that will lead to execution is that we are thinking and asking the right questions and we are taking corresponding action. So this area, I'm still very confused about it. It looks like a whole thing, but what I should then do is to go and seek out information about it as against ignoring it and figuring it out when we get there. That won't work. Okay, so the second thing, or well, let me just launch that thought, yeah? Big question, where are we going? We need to define the coordinates for whatever plan it is that we have, or the end goal. We have to define the coordinates. Where are we going, and what do we need to get there? Great executors use plans. God also makes plans. So we have to have targets and goals, and let the Holy Spirit show us the steps that are required to be taken. Jesus would say in Luke 14, chapter 28, which of you intending to build a tower does not sit down first and count the cost? Whether he has enough to finish it, lest after he has laid the foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it will begin to mock him, saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. So you and I need to be better planners so that we can execute appropriately. That's the first thought. The second is the need to overcome learned helplessness. Learned helplessness, which is a term used in psychology to describe a negative state of mind in which an individual believes that they have no control over their situation and thus they do not try to alter it. Learned helplessness. It says, my action doesn't count. That is the posture of learned helplessness. My action does not count. It won't amount to much. I'm a victim. So you know, it's, it's that victim mentality, that laissez fair mentality of whatever will be, will be. I'm not in control. See, the truth is, you might not be able to control your external environment. You might not be able to control who becomes president or not. You might not be able to control the exchange rates, but you can control the outcomes of your life by taking the necessary action. In liquidity risk management, there's something called hedging. In fact, in corporate finance, in general, there's, something, there's a principle called hedging. But to be able to hedge effectively, you must understand the risk. So a lot of us are not paying attention enough to the imminent risk. And so we attribute everything to our external environment, and we don't take responsibility for it. And that is not the people that God has designed us to. Sometimes we leave the re responsibility with God, and this has been attributed to Christians a lot. We leave the walk to God. God will provide, he will make the way, and he will walk the way. When he makes a way for you, say, Lord, way maker, make a way. He makes the way for you. The expectation is that you will journey on the way, right? The way that has been made for you. But half the time, that's not what it is. We expect God to come and carry us on the way and land us in that pot of blessedness or prosperity or whatever it is we're trusting him for. He will make a way for you. He will give rivers in the desert, but he expects you to do something, to take action, to put your hands to the plow and get work done. Remember, in Deuteronomy, he says he will bless the works of your hands. He will bless your barns and your fields, which speaks to walking it. So the dimension of grace that we, you know, we look to um, receiving from God, whether it's the favor factor, you know, whether it is a divine establishment and all, it comes with work. We say something here at LifePoint that your work must be the landing pad through which God can bless you, through which you can experience his favor. But you must always, you and I, we need to present something to God to work with. So, 
Um, I read earlier about the parable of the talent. I will not go back there again. But the, the servant with one talent found an excuse to abdicate responsibility. And for some of us, very similar. I remember having a conversation with someone a while back. And the person was telling me, complaining about just the state of things in their office and all. What was beautiful about that conversation was I didn't even need to say much. As she was speaking herself, she got to the place where she realized that, oh, maybe I brought this upon myself, which, wants, which will make me come into a thought very quickly, self-sabotaging. A lot of us do that. We consider the external conditions you know, to make decisions. So let me give you a classic example. You're in an office environment, and you feel that your boss is a very mean person, like this servant that, was, that Jesus described as wicked and lazy. See, he said nothing about the boss. He said, you are wicked and lazy, because how do they commit resources into your hand and you're unable to turn it around? How do, you, how do they give you a project brief? that you then go ahead and sabotage. How are you in that business? And you think that because, you know, the people you are executing that contract for are unrighteous men, and so it's okay for you to do it anyhow. Jesus never calls out the, you know, whatever disposition we have towards, you know, people of authority or whatever. It's always about us, the state of our hearts. The state of our hearts matters to him which is why he called him wicked and lazy. So you're in the office and the expectation is that you will deliver. You sign a contract, you have KPIs, and then performance appraisal shows up and then you are oming and eming and you're saying, well, um, the reason why I did not perform is because, because of you, sir, or because of you, ma. Or you decide, I'm gonna give it to them hot, hot. Your boss tells you one thing, you decide to be a certain way, you know, you're rude, and little things like that. And these things all show up together eventually. So you start, to, you then come to church and come and meet the pastor and say, I've not been promoted for a number of years now. And when we ask you questions, it then becomes, well, um, so my boss is a wicked, is a wicked man. We need to always, at every point in time, make sure we're giving God stuff he can work with. That he looks at us and he sees faithful people. He looks at us and he sees this, these ones are representing me. The conditions are not favorable, but they are representing me all right. They have given me, they have armed me with sufficient data to war with. Scripture says the battle is the Lord's. But when we don't do what we need to do, we make it impossible for God to do what he should do for us. So I hope that you're getting and you're picking your own points in all of this the state of your heart, your positioning, um, making plans that would lead to fruitful execution, and becoming people who take action. So learned helplessness shows up in different ways. Fear, imposter syndrome, self-doubt, um, of intellect, skills, or accomplishments among high, you know, high um, empowering individuals or high achieving individuals. And that was the state of the heart of the 10 spies. They looked around and were like, no, these guys, it's, not, it's completely impossible for us to win here. We can't take over this land. They are men of stature. They are bigger than us. They are better than us. Imposter syndrome. And I suspect that a number of us have experienced it at different points in time. I'm not, where I am now, I'm not, I'm, I'm not worthy of it. I'm not. But rather than focusing on that, the thought in our heads should be, God has presented this opportunity. I, I, I'm surrounded by older people. I'm the youngest here. We're listening to you at GLS yesterday. Meanwhile, great job to the organizing team of GLS. It was such a good one. Thank you. And for everyone who showed up, well done. I trust that you were, you, you were uh, thoroughly impacted because I personally enjoyed the session. But we're listening to the former Secretary of State, uh, Ms. Condoleezza Rice, and she was talking about you know, being in, 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 in meetings with Joint Chief of Staff as the only black female, you know, the only black young female. So she had like three things working against her, color, age, and gender. And she had to make a decision. I can choose to complain. I can choose to play, a, a, to embrace a victim mindset. I can choose to wait on them to accord me the respect that I deserve because I'm at the table with them or I choose to make them comfortable. So what kind of decisions are you and I making that would enable us, you know, fully manifest the glory? Or are we still embracing the victim mindset? If you are dealing with imposter syndrome, today God will deliver you and cause you to see yourself as worthy because you are worth the blood of Jesus. And every opportunity that you have now, right, 
is God that has placed you there. He has given you that platform. He has given you that pedestal. He has brought you into this place where it looks like I'm not deserving of it. But rather than sit there and think about how you are not deserving, it's to leverage grace, to leverage the spirit of God, to be able to, you know, deliver where he has placed you so that you represent him well. The last thought is this. I've spoken about planning and how planning helps us execute better. I've spoken about overcoming learned helplessness. The concept of learned helplessness. I suppose we'll deep dive that at uh, 618 just a bit more on Wednesday. Faith-filled actions. Summing it all together. Faith-filled action. Faith-filled action. So faith does. Faith works. Faith without works is dead. So says scripture. Faith without works is dead. And the example I want to use very quickly here is the story of the guys whose friend was infirmed. The man that was sick with palsy and his friends had to break the roof to get him to where Jesus was because going through the doors, everywhere was blocked. Scripture says that Jesus saw the faith of the friends. He saw the faith. How do you see faith? Yeah? How do you see faith? It's not by saying it. It's not by looking like it, looking like a prayed up person. It is in action. Jesus saw the action that those guys took and he attributed it as faith. Because they did everything they could to ensure that they got that guy to Jesus. So my question to you this morning is, are you doing everything that you should concerning this vision? Are you doing everything that you should concerning that which God has placed in your hands? Concerning your family, concerning your community, concerning your neighborhood, concerning that organization where you currently work. Are you doing everything that you should? Are you taking action? More importantly, are you taking faith-filled, faith-enabled action? Caleb said something, give me this mountain. I shall be able to drive them out. If you go and read the story of Caleb in Joshua 14, Joshua chapter um, 14, yes. He goes ahead and tells Joshua, look, guy, I was 40 years old when Moses gave this promise. 45 years after, I'm telling you that we, we have tread, we've walked the paths that God has promised. Because God's promise to the children of Israel is that every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, I will give you. And some of us have equal promises, maybe not in terms of la uh, landed territories now to take but everywhere the sole of your feet what does that tell you and i it means that my, the sole of my feet must actually get up and get moving right it can't be on i can't be on my bed i can't be in my house it means that i'm taking action i'm doing stuff i am moving he says everywhere the sole of your feet shall tread i will give to you and so Caleb comes back 45 years after that promise has been given after they have treaded the lands and they have taking them they've occupied those territories he comes and says to joshua guy 45 years after i'm strong enough i'm still as strong as i was 40 years uh, 45 years ago when that promise was given and this is the promise i will go up and i will take it i will go up i will take it i pray for you this morning that the things that the lord has been speaking to you whether it's current concerning the your the the work of your hands concerning next year concerning your family that today you will receive the courage to take action in Jesus' name. Because I know fear is holding a lot of us down. But you will receive courage to do what you must do, to dare the impossible in Jesus' name. Let's pray. Let's pray. And as we look to speaking to God about everything it is that I have touched on this morning, just by way of recap, planning makes execution better. The need to overcome learned helplessness. For us to stop playing the victim mentality. For us to stop finding excuses all the time of why we are unable to achieve our goals or to do the things that are needful for us to do. There would always be reasons. The economy may always be a certain way. Um, your parents may not give you permission. There would always be stuff. But being in that place where you recognize that by my God, I can run through troops. By my God, I can leap over a wall. By God, I can do the impossible. That is the state of, of heart and the posture that we need to maintain.
when it comes to overcoming that state of helplessness and abdicating responsibility. And of course, the third thing is faith-filled actions. I want to remind us here, one of the promises that Jesus gave to the disciples is that greater works that I did is what you will do. We see it in scripture. Greater works that I did when I walked the face of the earth is what you are able to do, is what I have equipped you to do. And we see someone, without going through all the disciples, we see someone who manifests that. Peter. Jesus was on earth. Jesus walked on water. Peter walked on water until he took his eyes off Jesus. When Jesus left the earth, Peter's shadow is recorded in scripture. Peter's shadow healed the sick. Peter raised the dead just the same way Jesus did. His shadow healed the sick. He did all of these things too. Jesus' shadow did not heal the sick. We didn't get that report in scripture. So we see that Peter had capacity to work in the greater works dimension. Are you ready for that today? As you look to God for next year, are you ready to work in the greater works dimension? As you submit your heart to him, as you surrender your plans and your purposes to him, as you overcome this feeling of, of immobility and stagnancy and everything else it is that come together to make you feel like you are not sufficient for the work and for the master's use. So as we pray this morning, would you go ahead and just speak to God? Is there anything it is that you require his help with? Especially when you think about overcoming learned helplessness. Someone needs to go ahead and declare, Lord, I, today I, I, I set myself loose from every feeling of inferiority complex where I keep comparing myself to others and I, I feel like I'm falling short. Every victim mindset, I decree and declare that I am delivered in the name of Jesus. Where I need to be strong, Lord, today I receive your strength. I receive your strength to think I receive your strength to run. I receive your strength to build with focus, with precision, with accuracy. In the name of Jesus, would you go ahead and make that your declaration this morning? Isaiah 60 chapter 1 says, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound. Would you go ahead and declare that over yourself, that in the name of Jesus, I am anointed. I am anointed. What is the work? What is the mission? What is it that God has placed in your hands this morning? Would you begin to declare that you are anointed to execute? Whether you're a student, you know, or you're looking to embrace professional development again, you want, to, you want to go to school, we say, I'm anointed to succeed in my educational pursuits, in my academic pursuits. Concerning the works of your hands, would you go ahead and declare, I'm anointed to add value to this organization. I'm anointed to solve problems in this organization. If you're looking to God and trusting him even for a job, you're currently in a transition season, you say, I'm anointed to attract the kinds of job where I can add value, where I can indeed be light and salt. Would you go ahead and declare that over yourself? In the name of Jesus, I am anointed to start this business. I am anointed to write this song. I am anointed to, to, to release this album. I am anointed to write this book. I am anointed for greater works in the name of Jesus because that is God's promise to you. Go ahead and declare over yourself where you are trusting him to work, where you are trusting you know, his anointing to be operational in your life. Go ahead and make those declarations. In the name of Jesus, I'm anointed to step out in faith to do good works. I'm anointed to solve problems in my industry, in my family. I'm anointed to solve national problems, to solve global problems. If the Lord is calling you to doing that, would you go ahead and declare that I'm anointed to execute briefs with creativity and excellence that will glorify God. I'm anointed to take on projects and to bring the mind of God to bear in those projects that people do not want to take. I am anointed to marry and to marry well. That needs to be somebody's declaration. I'm anointed to raise children aright and place them on the path of righteousness. I'm anointed. Go ahead and declare that I am anointed. And someone needs to declare that by reason of the anointing, we, we need to start breaking, you know, breaking certain limits, removing certain strongholds that are operational in our lives. By reason of the anointed, I overcome analysis paralysis. That needs to be somebody's declaration this morning. And in action, I overcome procrastination. I overcome laziness. By reason of this anointing, I overcome procrastination. I overcome laziness in the name of Jesus. I overcome the fear of failure and the repercussion of failure. I overcome every limiting mindset and every imposter syndrome. I overcome self-sabotaging behavior. In the name of Jesus, the spirit of the Lord God is upon us for execution. 
my capacity to execute, my capacity to bring the mind of God to bear in everything that I do is activated in the name of Jesus. The Spirit of God has been poured out upon us from on high. A, a wilderness is becoming a fruitful field in the name of Jesus as we embrace the principles of execution, of planning, of effective planning, creating smart goals, uh, as we embrace the principles of, of overcoming learned helplessness, no longer playing the victim mentality, but seeing ourselves as God sees us, embracing our position and our posture as children of God, children of light, salt indeed, would you go ahead and declare that I am becoming a fruitful field in the name of Jesus, an end has come to drought, an end has come to stagnancy in the name of Jesus, I am breaking barriers, I am moving ahead, I am breaking barriers, I am gaining momentum in the name of Jesus, like Paul today we decree and declare that we run not as one who is encumbered, we run the race that has been set before us with clarity, with accuracy, and with precision in the mighty name of Jesus. Father, we thank you and we give you praise. Thank you so much for that which it is you are doing and that which you are enabling through us. We thank you, our Father and our God, because you will continue to glorify yourself in us and you will continue to prove yourself through us. We give you praise in Jesus' mighty name we have prayed. Amen and amen. God bless you. Thank you so much for coming to church today.